reading with Raleigh and Willow, chapter 8, A Father's Legacy. What does it mean when society says you're unfit to be a mother? Are there circumstances to be factored in before that judgment is made? What if a mother is doing the best she can in the face of crushing adversity, but still doesn't measure up to society standards? When does a mother lose her right to be a mother? There is a story of a young mother named Maria Giuseppe Benedetto, who was left alone to raise her six children when her husband, Pasquale, was drafted into the Italian army in 1914. Maria and Pasquale lived in the southern Italian town of Gioia del Pove, one of the poorest regions in the country. The men were mostly farmers like Pasquale, struggling against constant drought and harsh terrain. Still, they tilled the same parched land their ancestors tilled, and they kept their families going the best they could. But when Pasquale was called to the military service at the start of World War I, his family faced catastrophe. Maria and her children, the eldest was 13, were left with no source of food or income, save for the barren land. They scavenged the fields for anything edible, scrounging stray dandelions or anything else that could help make a meal. Pasquale was allowed to come home some weekends to help his eldest son, Pietro, work the farm. But the long winter months passed slowly. Maria lay awake on cold nights, worrying her children would starve. Then, during one of Pasquale's visits, Maria became pregnant with her seventh child. Now, she needed her husband more than ever. When she was in her eighth month, Early in 1917, she hitched up the horse and wagon and left Pietro in charge of the others and took the trip to military headquarters in the town of Bari. There, she sought out the commanding officer, barged into his office and demanded her husband be discharged. He has six hungry children at home, she told him. He belongs with his family. The officer felt pity, but could do nothing to help. The best he had was to offer was a promise to keep Pasquale away from the front lines so he'd be safe until the war was over. Maria, distraught and exhausted, steered the horse back to Joya del Cole on rutted dirt roads. Along the way, she felt a great pain in her stomach. She made it home just in time to give birth to her seventh child, Annunciata. Now things were tougher than ever, but they would get even worse. In Bari, Pasquale's commander broke his promise and shipped him to the Italian front in Gorizia, where the army sought to seize Austrian land along the Anunzo River. Nine times before, the army had tried securing this territory, and all nine times they had failed. The tenth campaign fared no better. Two months after giving birth, Maria got word Pasquale had been shot and killed in action. Now she was a widow with seven young children. The local authorities finally took notice and stepped in. What they decided to do was declare Maria unfit to care for all of her children and take two of them away. Young Luca was sent to the state school for boys while Cristina was packed away to the Instituto Feminile di Maria Cristina di Savoia, a boarding school run by nuns. They were kept there, away from their family, for several years. Maria was allowed to visit them once a month. And then, in the summer of 1917, Maria's mother fell ill. Maria left Petro in charge of his sisters, Rosa and Anna, and his brother, Donato. While she trudged to her mother's home in the nearby hills, her infant in tow. One day, after finishing their chores, the children were playing in the field, skipping and running and throwing sticks, when young Anna, then five,
came upon the family's well. It was a hole in the ground surrounded by slabs of white rock with a larger white stone moved on and off to seal the hole. Maria, in her haste, had left the big stone off. Now and now, young Anna tried to tiptoe around the edge of the well just for fun. She tripped and fell, tumbling down the hole. Rosa ran one mile to her grandmother's house to get help, but it was too late. The child drowned at the bottom of the well. Local authorities investigated the instant incident and deemed Maria unfit to handle her family. Now young Rosa, not yet eight, was sent away to the Maria Cristina de Savoia. Society had come up with a solution to Maria's problems. The solution was to take her children away. But there was nothing Maria could do, and she found solace in knowing her daughters were enjoying their time at school. Still, Maria could not get over the pain of losing her family. She vowed that one day she would bring all of her children together again, and she wrote to her brother Pietro who, with the help of her brother-in-law, had emigrated to America. She had asked them for help in moving her family there too. They sent her enough money to make the trip to America. Maria pulled her children from their schools and in January 1921, boarded a boat called, called the Duca de Osa, docked at port in Naples. The boat met hellacious storms in the Atlantic and a sailor had to save Rosa from being hurled overboard. On February 19, 1921, the Duca de Osta docked at Ellis Island in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, and Maria and her family set foot on American soil. They were quarantined on the island for several weeks because Annunziata had the measles, but eventually they were free to go. They took a clanking subway ride uptown and moved into a cramped tenement apartment on East 112th Street with barely enough room for all of them. However, it had a sink, a stove, an icebox, and indoor plumbing, things that they never had before. They lived their lives in America with all of its glories and hardships, and their children's children lived good lives too, and even their children and even theirs. I know this to be true because Maria Giuseppe Benedetto was my great grandmother. Little Rosa, one of the daughters taken from Maria and who she took back was my grandmother. I've heard stories of how playful and clever Rosa was. While she was young, she was put in charge of cleaning the supper dishes. She watched the family dog lick his plate clean and got an idea. One by one, Rosa gave the dinner plates to the dog until he licked them all clean. Her mother was impressed with how quickly and thoroughly she had done her chores, and she had, she had, had gotten away with it if her sister Annunziata hadn't ratted her out. In elementary school, Rosa discovered she had a beautiful singing voice. She sang in the church choir, and the family even saved enough money to buy a second-hand piano for her lessons. But the joy she took from singing would not last long. In her teens, she met a man named Sebastiano Vito Puccino, dark, handsome, and 10 years older than her. Sebastiano's life from an early age was one of hard, uncompromising work. When he was an eight-year-old boy growing up on the farm in Joya del Cole, the same poor town where Rosa was raised, he was taken out of school and sent into the fields to shepherd a large flock of sheep. That meant rising before dawn, packing some food, and tending to the sheep as they grazed on the hillside for 12 hours. He spent his days alone with only the sheep for company. This experience shaped the person he became. After serving in the elite Bersagli Ari Corps in the Italian Army for five years coming to America in 1923, 
Sebastiano worked as a laborer for the Erie Lackawanna Railroad, and then as a building supervisor, and then as a skilled plasterer, demanding backbreaking jobs. The guiding principle of his life was to provide for the family he started with Rosa, seven children in all, and to instill in them the value of hard work and sacrifice. Gespaciano, being a man, meant always being diligent, never being soft, and refusing to tolerate anything frivolous. One thing Sebastiano could not tolerate, tolerate was singing. Sebastiano forbade his wife from singing in a choir or anywhere else. He believed her beautiful voice made her more attractive to the other men. And so, the dutiful wife that she was, she never sang in public again. I would like to think that in private moments, my grandmother sang her heart out away from her husband's ears, but I do not know for sure that she did. Another frivolous thing for Sebastiano was affection. Sebastiano was not a tyrannical father. Some Sunday mornings, he'd take his children to the bakery for fresh rolls and walnut rings. And in the summer, he drove them to the Carvel for ice cream. But he had been raised by an abusive father who showed him no affection. And he did not believe a parent should ever show any feelings for his children. Being demonstrative was a sign of weakness, and Sebastiano was anything but weak. He believed his children should be raised not with love, but with discipline and, if warranted, physical punishment. At suppers, he kept a strap across his lap for his children to see. They knew to never talk during meals, lest they get a sharp strike across the hands. My grandfather, Sebastiano, witnessed few moments of love and affection between his own parents, and so he avoided them with his own wife and children. No one ever taught him how to show and share his love, or even that such thing was permissible. He came to believe that it wasn't. Il solo tempo, lei dovrebbe baciare i suoi bambini in quando he would say. This means the only time you should kiss your children is when they are asleep. The children all had complicated relationships with their father. And one of them, Marie, my mother, realized that at a very young age that she needed to flee his brutal control. And so, when she ju was just 19, she fell for and married a man she believed could take her away from her old family and into a new and happy one of her own. But sometimes we are not drawn to that which is different from what we know and fear. Sometimes we are drawn to that which is exactly the same.